Well, let's open our Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. If you're wondering what Revelation has to do with Christmas, uh, I can tell you this, it has plenty to do with Christmas. And as we take a look at these particular chapters, uh, we took some time to break Revelation into uh, three uh, parts. And what John was instructed to do was to write down uh, what he saw. And then he was to write down the things that were at that particular time, and then the things that were to come after that time. And the things that were, were the church. And that was uh, taken care of in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. In chapter 4, he starts to write the things that are after the church. And chapters 4 through 19 deals with the future. Chapters 4 and 5 are an introductory chapter to the uh, what's going to happen during the tribulation time period when the seals are broken. So we're in the middle of setting the stage. And as we uh, set the stage in chapter 4, chapter 4, the main idea is the throne of God. And we've gone through the four beasts, the 24 elders, the, um, uh, the glass sea, the uh, rainbow that goes around the throne, and it's very difficult to capture uh, in any one picture what this is. I, in the past, I had several pictures that tried to, to uh, picture this, uh, this right here. You, you might, if you remember, uh, and I'll just make this comment, that the uh, pictures that we see are symbolisms. Uh, they picture things. And, uh, and as we think of a lion, uh, we think of majesty. And that's going to show up again in chapter 5. As we think of an ox, or uh, we think of strength. As we think of a man, believe it or not, uh, we have intelligence. It was man that was made and created in the image of God. And as we think of an eagle, uh, we think of, of striking silently, quickly, and uh, the speed of what's going to happen. And by the way, folks, when judgment comes, it's coming like an eagle strikes. And people are, uh, many people are going to be caught uh, off guard. We looked at the cherubim uh, that was uh, we were introduced to. And then we come to chapter 5, and the theme in chapter 5, the throne is chapter 4, but the theme in chapter 5 is the book, and it's literally a scroll that John uh, sees. So let's take a look, and we'll see uh, what we have with this right here. Um, the uh, verse 1, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And as we uh, stop and we uh, consider uh, this right hand, uh, the uh, don't have a picture of a hand. And uh, let me roll up the bulletin. <laughs> All right. Um, the hand, the right hand, is, uh, is symbolic. And as we stop and we think of this right hand, it's more like an offer. He is handing the scroll. It'd be like this right here. And, uh, and as we think of these, this scroll with the seven seals, I might just uh, mention this to you, that the hand... Uh, represents work. What do you work with? You work with your hands. And what God has in the seals, some work that needs to be done. And he is holding this out in his right hand. This is God the Father in heaven holding out. And we have a, uh, and this is hard to pick, 
But uh, scrolls at this particular time it was very unusual, if not almost ever, that scrolls were written on both sides. They typically were written on one side. If any of you have study Bibles, they probably make that particular note. And the Bible doesn't tell us uh, why this was written on both sides. But what we can conclude, I think fairly, is this. Is that when it's written on both sides, what we have is a complete picture of what's going to happen. Uh, this is final. This is complete. And it's full of truth. And uh, we, we have this in the scroll. Now the seven seals, and I know the picture right here, it's, it's hard to get this uh, 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 to be, uh, show exactly what it is. But the scroll was no doubt made up of the seven parts. And the second seal couldn't be opened until the first seal was opened. So you would open the first seal and read it. And when that was done, you could open the second seal. So if you could picture, uh, I, I was going to play paper dolls and, and actually cut uh, seven uh, for you so you could kind of picture that. But I think we get it. You get that? And, uh, and so the first seal and then the second seal, you don't go to the uh, seventh seal. You can't do that until the first six seals have been peeled off. So we have this picture in uh, verse 1. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. And uh, the, uh, uh, this angel with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And as we stop and we think of what is this angel saying? He's, he's talking in a loud voice. And the loud voice pictures this. There is something important that he wants to say. And he wants people to hear what he is saying. And what does he say? He says this. He's literally asking the question, who is worthy to open this book and to loose these seals as he holds it out? And as I just mentioned, in the hand pictures a work that needs to be done. Who is worthy, but who is also able to do this? And what work needs to be done? The work that is contained in these seals is this. To punish sin. To, um, and then to establish judgment. Imagine that execution of judgment and the establishment of righteousness. <laughs> Who can do that? And the uh, angels, or the angel here is trying to uh, raise the question and he wants everyone to hear this particular point. And as we stop and we think of uh, this point, it's, it's interesting that in the ancient world, uh, Egypt. Egypt wanted world peace. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, they wanted a peaceful life. The Greeks also wanted peace and tranquility. The Romans came along and they were more interested in justice. And I might just say that they did a pretty good job on it. Uh, and in fact, uh, our English law and stuff can be traced back to the Roman justice system. And yet, was there justice? Did the Greeks have peace? Did, no, that's where the old Trojan horse thing came into play, right? Uh, did the Egyptians have peace? The answer is no. And what we see is throughout the history, in fact, what does the UN want? The UN wants to unite the world and bring peace to the world. How are they doing? I, I, I think you don't hardly have to read a newspaper to know they're not doing very well. And as we stop and we think, who can do this? Who can straighten out, right the wrongs of this world, and bring in peace 
and, uh, and righteousness. Who can do that? And the angel loudly uh, asked the question. And the answer to that question is going to be kind of frightening. And as we uh, stop and look, uh, verse 3, we'll read on. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Now, as we look at those verses, let me just ask you a question. Who is not talked about in verse 3? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not mentioned in verse 3. And I'll just remind you of this, that without Jesus Christ, there is no hope for this world. In fact, without Jesus Christ, you know what we get? We get verse 4. Verse 4 is nothing but what? It is tears. Uh, I wept much. And that's what we have without Jesus Christ. I'll, I'll, I, I can't emphasize this point enough. Uh, boy, this is a great Christmas story, isn't it? I mean, think about this. Justice and righteousness in the right hand of God the Father. Who can execute this justice and righteousness? There isn't a human being that can do it. And yet, what do we find in this world? We find organizations, we find political parties, we find politicians who run for office. What do they, what do they promise? They all promise justice for all. They all promise prosperity for all. Hey, how are they doing? When we look at the big scene of things, I'll tell you what, we should all be crying, shouldn't we? We should be crying with, just like John was crying right here. Listen, there is no hope without Jesus Christ. And with the justice and righteousness being held out, nobody can step forward. There isn't any help, not even the angels can bring this. But glad for us, the story doesn't end there. Now listen, this book is written to the church. And it's written to the church to tell us what the future is going to hold. It's going to tell us, in fact, he says, write this to the seven churches, the things that are. And as we stop and we think of the church today, I'll tell you, there's a lot going on that can be discouraging, isn't there? And by knowing the future, and by knowing what God is going to do in, in fulfilling this 70th week of Daniel, we today can have hope. We uh, can have something that we don't have to cry about. And we see that in the next verse. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And as we uh, stop and we think of the lion of the tribe of Judah, um, the, uh, uh, where'd that come from? And what is that uh, all about? And the lion of the tribe of Judah actually goes back to Genesis chapter 49. And, you know, we might as well just uh, uh, take a look there. I know in Sunday school we took some time to, to uh, look at this, but in Genesis chapter 49, while Jacob is dying, he is giving some blessing. And in verse 9, he says this. Oh, I'll back up to verse 8. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. They have Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. 
So what's he picturing here? He's picturing a king. He's picturing a victorious king. Uh, verse 9. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, Shiloh is Jesus Christ, until he comes, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And as we stop and we think of, of who is he talking about, and I might just say <coughs> that uh, the tribulation time period is not for the church, it's for the nation of Israel. Israel is, uh, this is their 70th week. This is the time that God is going to prepare the nation of Israel and the world for the kingdom that is going to come. We're getting ready for this lion to come. And it's interesting, as John is called into heaven, and he sees the scroll, and apparently he knows that this scroll contains justice and righteousness for the world. And he's crying, because it's out of the reach of every person. Who can open this? And the, one of the elders says, look, look at the lion. Now what's interesting is that he looks at the lion, and, or he says to look, and here's what it says. Well, let, let's, let's read the verse. Uh, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed uh, to open the book and to loose, loose the seven seals thereof. I might just say that the root of David uh, has uh, uh, significance in the scripture. Uh, look with me if you would. Keep your finger here, and we'll come back to uh, Isaiah. Isaiah, one of the major prophets Isaiah chapter 11. And as we look at Isaiah chapter 11, uh, we read this in verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Uh, who is Jesse? Jesse is David's father. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And we have what this spirit is, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with the righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And the righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Kind of sounds like a political speech today. In fact, the next verse is often used by politicians as they talk about the utopia that you will get if you vote for me. It says, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall uh, he uh, down with the kid, and uh, or lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the, and the nursing child shall play on the hole of, a, of an adder, and the weakened child shall put his hand on the cockadrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. Now let me just ask you this question. For these things to happen, I'm going to tell you something, there's going to have to be some real changes 
that are going to uh, take place. And who is able to do and make these particular changes? And, uh, and what do we have? We have in Revelation chapter uh, 5, what we just read, you can flip back there, we uh, uh, see this. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, we know where that comes from. And you know what? That's what the tribulation time period is really all about. It's about preparing the world and preparing the nation of Israel for this king that's going to come. For this time period that's described in Isaiah uh, chapter 11. That's what it's all about. And, uh, and so he says this, the root of David hath prevailed or overcome. And as we stop and we think of that, what we see is this, is that there is someone who is worthy to open the book. And it's this line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He is the overcomer. Now we know that that is Jesus Christ. That's the Messiah. And as we stop and we just get this picture, um, that's the hope of the world. What did the angel tell, or the elder, excuse me, tell John? He said, stop crying. There's a lion of Judah who can open this book. And what's he saying? He's saying this, listen, there is a hope for the world. There is someone who can create justice, right the wrongs, and establish righteousness. There's someone. And guess what, John? You don't have to cry. You don't have to cry. And I'll tell you what this, as I, I just mentioned, without this hope, you better start crying. Because verse 3 is bad news for us. But the good news is that there is one who is coming. Now, this is interesting as we stop and we look at this particular verse because he says, Behold, all right, and I beheld, verse 6, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, what did he say? The elder said, one of the elders said, Weep not, behold. Now, now this is interesting. So, so bear with me on this. He says what? Behold the lion. So I beheld. And I look. And I saw a lamb. He's told. Uh, no, no. Now listen, folks. If uh, I told you this, behold and see the pulpit, and I point to the tree, you would say, well, he's got mixed up, didn't he? And yet, the elder said, behold the lion. So I looked, and I saw a lion. And as we stop and we think of, of this lamb, uh, this is I don't know about you, but I find all this interesting. Come on, indulge me a little bit. This is an this is a, a interesting scene that we have. He says, uh, Behold, I look, and I look for the lion, and in the midst of the elder stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And as we... Stop it when we think of uh, uh, the lamb right here. Uh, you know, if you understand the divisions in the Bible, uh, it's easy for us to say, oh, well, that's the first coming of Christ. And that's, the lion is the second coming of Christ. And that's absolutely true. Jesus Christ came. In fact, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, as we uh, stop and we think of the Christmas story when his ministry started he said this, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and we say, see, that's the first coming of Christ 
But the elder told John, look at the lion. And he looked and he saw the lamb. And he saw this lamb as if it was slain. And then it had seven horns and seven eyes. And uh, uh, let me just make a point about uh, the picture that you have. And uh, you can Google and you can look back, and particularly in the mid ages, Middle Ages, when artists would draw these pictures. And I can remember one lamb. It was a lamb that was cut, and blood was running down the lamb, uh, lamb, and then it had seven horns that were drawn on it, and then it had seven eyes wrapped around the head. And uh, uh, how do you picture that? It's kind of weird, isn't it? It's weird. And uh, keep in mind that this is not what we see in heaven. This is symbolism of what the qualities of heaven are. And it's, it's interesting as we uh, stop and we think of uh, uh, how all of this uh, uh, works and plays together. Uh, Take a look with me, if you would, at an illustration of that in Zechariah. Now, you might, Zechariah is one of those books you probably don't read every day for your devotions. It's the second to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah. And we'll take a look at chapter 1. And we'll see what Zacharias saw. Just to illustrate this point, that this stuff is symbolic, it has meaning. Now look, look at what he says in verse 18. Then lifted I up my eyes, and saw and beheld, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these? And and we could say, well, what do you mean, what are those? They're four horns. What's the matter with you? Well, he understood. And what he was asking was, is what do the four horns mean? And the angel goes on and explains that these four horns and horns in the Bible, typically, we could look up a lot of passages that would illustrate this point, speak of power and authority and, uh, uh, and here... Uh, nations uh, took over Israel with power and uh, crushing force. And what we see then is a picture of power. Now think about this. Here is the lamb with seven horns. And you say, oh, that's kind of weird. Uh, seven horned lamb uh, that's bleeding. Um, how, what does that look like? The question is, what does it mean? And what we see in this lamb is power. That's what the, thor or the horns represent. We see authority. We see uh, ability to get things done. Remember? The scroll. Who's able? And it's not just who is willing to do it. It's who's able to do it. Who can do this? Who is worthy to do this? And it's the lamb is willing to do it. And he's able to do it. And he has the power to do it. In fact, we're told that this lamb has overcome death. And how much more powerful can you be than that? We're also told that this lamb is waiting to do what? To uh, make his enemies his footstool. Now, does that take power? Absolutely it does. What do the horns represent? And what's interesting is in the scripture, the, the number seven oftentimes speaks of completeness. And what we see in this lamb is complete power to fulfill the will of the Father here on earth. And we see something else about this. We see that this lamb, and we'll go back to Revelation, that this lamb is standing. And as we stop and we think of standing, 
It's interesting that when Jesus Christ was resurrected, the book of Hebrews tells us that he went and he did what? He sat at the right hand of the Father. Yet when John sees this lamb, he's not sitting. He is standing. And let me just suggest this to you, that sitting down means or represents that a work has been completed. But when you stand up, you're ready to go. And Jesus Christ now stood up, and he's ready to do and fulfill what's in the scrolls. And he's standing. And we see in this land, <clears throat> not only is he standing and is he ready, but he has the power to do it. And he also has seven <coughs> eyes. And as we stop and we think of seven eyes, the verse explains to us that it's the seven spirits of God. And as we stop and we think of the eyes and seeing and the intelligence and the knowledge that we just had, listen, when Jesus Christ moves with power, it's not going to be like many of our politicians. What should their motto be? Uh, ready, shoot, aim. Oh, no. It's ready, aim, shoot. Okay. Um, isn't, don't, don't we have politicians that do that? It's uh, ready, shoot, and then we'll aim. Um, <clears throat> think about that. This lamb can see, and he sees the truth, he understands the truth, he, he knows what needs to be done, he knows how to do it, and he's able to do it. We have a tremendous uh, picture of Jesus Christ, and there's something else that we see in here, he says, as if he was slain, and now he's standing. Well, how can a slain lamb uh, stand? Well, it is pictures the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have the resurrection pictured here. Jesus Christ did die, and yet he's seen as if he was slain, and I think what we have pictured there is this, that the marks that Jesus Christ bore on the cross are permanently there. Remember the story in the upper room where um, uh, Thomas says, I won't believe unless I can stick my finger in, the, in his hand and stick my hand in his side and Jesus shows up and says Thomas give me your finger and Thomas never did poke his finger in his hands uh, he just said my Lord and my God he recognized who he was but I think when we get to heaven we're going to recognize Jesus Christ by his marks and he's resurrected and he's standing in this scene ready to move uh, and open the scroll and start the seven-year tribulation period that's going, to, that, that's going to happen. But you know, I think there's another picture in all of this too. And that's this. It's not just the first coming and the second coming, but there's another principle involved here. And the principle is this, that suffering precedes Reigning. And by the way, that is true with us today as a church. The Bible tells us that in the measure that we're willing to suffer with him, we'll reign with him. In fact, the Apostle Paul actually made uh, uh, kind of fun of, or kind of in jest, says, you know, you people want to reign before the time. You think you're kings already? You're not. You're servants. And we see this picture very clearly in the book of Philippians. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. And we'll take a, just a, a brief look at Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2, a familiar passage of scripture. And we read in verse 6 who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, 
It was made in the likeness of men. Now this is the first coming of Jesus Christ. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. There, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. What came first? The servant and obedience to death, the suffering of Jesus Christ, or the exaltation? The exaltation came after the, uh, the suffering of Christ. Look at verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things that are under the earth. And as we stop and we think of this exaltation that is going to happen in the future. Interesting. He suffered first. <clears throat> in fact, as we think of being worthy to open the book, did you know that the suffering of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, <laughs> makes him worthy to open the scroll? He is worthy. To open that scroll and we have this wonderful picture and I hope as we we look at the future and we see the king <coughs> is coming we can dry our eyes church because what we see happening in heaven is a preparation for what straightening the mess out here on earth and that's what we have in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 is an introduction to the things to come. The setting of the stage. This is what we have. But we're not done with chapter 5. We're going to see that the response to that is praise and worship. Come back next week and we'll take a look at praise and worship. In the meantime, don't forget that Jesus Christ is the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. This Lamb died on the cross for who? He died for you. He died for me. He died to take away the sins of the world. And in His death, this Lamb, and in fact, on Wednesday nights we've been talking about God the Father, who is the one who's holding the scroll. He was satisfied with Jesus Christ. He was satisfied with his, with his sacrifice that he made. We call that propitiation. And the one who propitiated God the Father is the one who's able and worthy to open the scrolls that is going to set everything straight. Do you know that Savior, Jesus Christ? Is he your Savior? And the Bible gives us a hope. And that hope for this nation, that hope for the world, that hope for you as an individual lies in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in it, we have uh, the Christmas story. What a story it is. Let's pause for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that as the Lamb that was slain, you satisfied the Father. You sat down at the right hand, but there's a day coming when you are going to stand up and be ready to move and be ready to right the wrongs of this world. We thank you that you indeed are the hope. And we just thank you that as your children today, uh, we don't have to cry about the future which would be hopeless without Jesus Christ. But we can move on with confidence and give glory and praise to who you are. We thank you for this. We thank you for this reminder. And we thank you that your salvation is made available to anyone, to all who believe. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.